Well, hello, I am Dr. Darian Pollard, president of Montgomery College, and thank you for joining us for our discussion with Decision Maker series, where you can hear from key leaders about today's issues. Now, as a college president, my role is to make sure that our students receive affordable education that prepares them with skills that make them ready for the job market or for transfer. To ensure that we accomplish this goal as an institution, we have to take down barriers to help students succeed. We help our students transfer so they can earn their baccalaureate degree, and that will help them to join the workforce here in Montgomery County's knowledge-based economy. But often there are too many roadblocks ahead to earn that important degree. It would be easy for a student with an associate's degree to transfer from a Maryland Community College to a Maryland four-year institution, and it should be easy to transfer as a junior, not having to retake classes for credit. This is an important issue for our community, students, employers, residents, and educational institutions. And that's why it's my pleasure to welcome one of Montgomery County's leaders and a strong voice on student transfer issues, Delegate Jarrett Solomon, who is actually, I'm gonna name him now my transfer hero. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Solomon is a state delegate who represents Montgomery County's District 18, which encompasses Wheaton, North Bethesda, Kensington, and Chevy Chase. Additionally, Dele so Delegate Solomon is a member of the House of Appropriations Committee and a member of his Education and Economic Development Committee subcommittee. A former teacher, he has been an advocate for education and a friend of Montgomery College. Thank you so much for joining me today, Delegate Solomon. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and might I say, it is a pleasure to be with a doctor in the house. So thank you for, for all of your work and, and the work of, uh, of your colleagues. And I can't wait until we have a doctor of education in the White House who, who knows how important community colleges are. From your mouth, we are extremely, and who understands the value of what these institutions represent in today's economy. And that probably is one of the uh, great places to start our conversation today. Uh, as I mentioned, we know that Montgomery County is a knowledge-based economy. Uh, with our county's flourishing biotech industry and other high-skilled employers, the nature of jobs in Montgomery County requires a college degree. Uh, there are many opportunities for those with a bachelor's degree, engineers, cybersecurity analysts, biotech professionals, software developers, and so many more. In fact, many industries are in need and are looking for skilled talent. Uh, there are employers with available jobs, but there is a skills gap that exists right now. They need to fill jobs with residents who are educated, trained, and ready. Now for you as an education policy leader, what are your thoughts on the importance of post-secondary education in our county's economy and workforce? Well, you're, you're much too kind in, uh, in, in the compliments there, Dr. Pollard, but you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and you hit the nail on the head just as you were you know, leading, uh, leading off with the list of, of the new, um, new industries that are, that are becoming prominent in our county. Um, you know, and we know overall in, in Maryland that 69% of jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary education um, or post-secondary experience over the next 10 years. And so whether that's uh, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or, you know, a, a high quality credential, um, you know, as, as we're trying to prepare our students for the next, you know, jobs that we can't even really think about, right? Gene editing, um, you know, technicians for for biotech positions that are that are growing every day for you know cybersecurity and and you know computer uh, tech jobs. Um, we know that it's going to require specialized skills, and and we don't want to leave anybody behind. And frankly, you know, as much as this is about you know ten years down the line, this is also about tomorrow. Um, you know, we have been we have been blessed to have incredible biotech companies that, you know, are leading really the global response to the pandemic that we're in right now. And, you know, when you look at a company, company like Novavax, um, you know, which is right in the thick of things, um, you know, they're looking to hire 400 new people. And, and you know, it's, it's one thing if we can get them from outside, but how much better is it to grow, you know, our economy with, with people who, who are from the, the county, who grew up here, who wanna make their home here. Um, and in order to do that, we need to, have, uh, we need to have an education system that recognizes that, that is nimble enough to, to produce those, those kind of graduates. And, and that's the role that, that Montgomery College plays and our four-year system as well. 
You know, I love the, the recognition you described because certainly at Montgomery College, we produce many students who will go right into work directly from their education at Montgomery College, but many more of our students will start at the college to earn an associate's degree, but then transfer to a four-year institution to earn the baccalaureate. Uh, community colleges provide that important affordability option. It's our mission to deliver access to post-secondary education for our, for our community's residents so that anyone, no matter their zip code can grab a hold of opportunity, earn a degree, and thrive in the county's workforce. This is even more critical in today's economy as we work to rebound from this public health crisis that we're all experiencing. Uh, community colleges like Montgomery Colleges, we let uh, students complete those first two years with lower tuition costs and all of their barriers to transferring that we will discuss in a moment, we provide a successful transfer for many students. In fact, over the last three years, we've had about 13,379 students have transferred to four-year institutions across the country. In fact, institutions like Georgia Tech, uh, Howard, George Washington University, Dickinson, Smith, and so many more. Uh, importantly, though, the top five institutions that we transfer students to are all in state, in part because they're the most affordable options. University of Maryland, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, University of Maryland Global Campus, Towson University and Salisbury University. So we know that community colleges provide affordable access to quality education, so much so that the National Science Foundation says that 50% of the nation's scientists start their career academically at a community college. So affordability is a quality that allows Montgomery College to produce homegrown skill uh, talent for our county's workforce. And we have so many examples of that. You know, I think of a student, uh, actually alum, I should say, uh, Shruti Mystery, who earned her Associates of Arts at Montgomery College, then transferred to earn both a bachelor's and master's degree. And now she's a biomedical engineer for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Nate Latinsky started at Montgomery College, then transferred to University of Maryland. He's now an electrical engineer at Northrop Grumman. And then, of course, Jose Chavez also got his start at Montgomery College, transferred to University of Maryland, is now a software developer at Lidos. Can you share your thoughts, uh, Delegate Solomon, on the role of community colleges in providing access to earning baccalaureate degrees? Uh, how do you see the role of community colleges in delivering this talent pipeline for Maryland? Yeah, well, you know, so, so I mean, again, you you sort of hit the nail on the head with the description of, of your alum um, and your students. I mean, it's a, it's a couple of different ways. I mean, first off, um, we know, frankly, you know, our community college system is way more nimble um, you know, frankly, sometimes than our our our, our four year systems are, and and I mean that in in the sense of you know for a student that knows well I, I need you know this specialized credential to be able to go work for a Novavax or you know to another biotech company uh, maybe I don't need that four year degree right now they can enroll in a credential program they can finish in a year or two they can always go back and get more but you know for that initial credential that is so critical to to just enter the workforce uh, and that training program. That's that's one thing that you all provide, and then you know, in a, a, another sense, this is a this is a starting point for um, you know for students who may not be able to afford a four year school right away, or you know maybe they're not sure that that college is really where where they where they they see themselves. They they kind of need to ease into it, or maybe they're first generation, and so the whole system is new to them. And so you know, five hundred thousand Marylanders um, each year attend Maryland's community colleges. We've got sixteen across across the state, and. You know, we need to make sure that those students have an entry point. And again, you know, we've done a lot at the state level, um, you know, around the Promise Program, around incentivizing dual enrollment. And what we're saying to students is, you know, you can save a tremendous amount of money. Oftentimes, you can get a much more personalized experience, you know, at that community college. Um, and and we need to make sure that that for students who want to continue, that there isn't you know, a myriad of barriers put in the way. Um, you know, there's a really interesting statistic that I saw from our Department of Legislative Services that, you know, starting in uh, in 2006, there was about a third of the overall um, overall folks who had uh, completed a degree, um, you know, from our four-year institutions had actually started um, or earned an associate's degree at, at a community college. That was in 2006, so that was about 15 years ago. Um, when you flat, fast forward about 10 years, and sometimes the, you know, the data lags a little bit, but more than half, 
um, of, of folks who had, again, completed uh, a four-year degree started at a community college. So I can imagine if we were looking at data from, you know, from last year or this current year, that number has only increased. And as we're saying to students, you know, go to a community college, you know, get your, get your, uh, you know, associates, get your initial, um, you know, initial general education program out of the way, you know, in that personalized way where you can, you can figure out if college is really for you and you can, you can get it for free with the Promise program. We have to make sure that there are pathways for those students to go on and, and continue to get their bachelor's. You know, I, I, this is why you're my transfer hero, because you know the language, you know the data, and you understand it. Because, you know, certainly while there are many benefits and many outcomes successfully uh, that we can talk about a transfer, we know there are, there are barriers that our students face. Uh, one of them we see is a student's transfer from the community college, and then they're told they have to repeat a course that they have already completed at the community college. And we know this costs time, it costs money, and it certainly slows down their progression to completion. So we offer at, at Montgomery College College, a whole office is dedicated toward helping to create transfer agreements to smooth the way to our four-year partners. Nonetheless, a transfer process in the state of Maryland uh, should be easier and should be more inclusive. I think if we can get rid of those barriers, we could really reduce institutional costs and more importantly, reduce the time and money the students earn on a degree. And I know this is an issue that you've heard about and talked about, because I know we've talked about it personally. What do you hear from your constituents and colleagues about the challenges that community college students face today when they transfer to earn a baccalaureate degree? Yeah, well, first off, I, I want to say that we have we have a lot of work to do in our state. Um, and so, you know, first and foremost, it's it's about getting better data. I mean, you know, we all have anecdotal reports, you know, I think the community college system has done a great job of of really trying to catalog and 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 you know and, and comprehensively present that. But what we really need is is the data. And you know, some of my colleagues years ago asked the Maryland Higher Education Commission to do just that. Um, and unfortunately, that data is not being collected. And so first and foremost, we've got to get our hands around, you know, why, why uh, MHEC is not doing what we've asked them to do, um, because we really, we really need numbers. Um, and, you know, but what I, what I hear is, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science when you think about it. It is, you know, students take a class at a community college and then they find out that, you know, the, the requirements may have changed at the school they're, they're going to transfer to. And it turns out that, um, you know, it doesn't quite meet what they thought it was supposed to meet. And lo and behold, um, you know, the, the credit doesn't get there. Um, sometimes it's as simple as the computer systems not talking to one another. Um, you know, we, we need to make investments in, in the infrastructure of, of higher education, and that includes, you know, computer systems that talk to one another, that, that seamlessly work across the state, that allow students to track their progress to see what they're getting. But, you know, we've heard horror stories, and I, I'm sure you have plenty of them, of, you know, where, frankly, you know, uh, somebody looked at it, uh, looked at a, a student's transcript, but it was too late. Um, you know, and and six months after they had already repeated the class, they found out, oh, you know, that 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 credit actually should have transferred, and that student not only is out the money, but they're out the time. Um, and then, you know, sometimes again, you know, we've we've talked a little bit about how for particularly first generation college students who may not be used to, you know, they don't understand the process, they may not know fully how to advocate. It's it's intimidating to walk into you know a provost or you know an administrator's office and and say, look. You know, I don't understand why these credits aren't transferring. Sometimes it's just easier to say, I, you know, I'm I'm working two jobs or I'm taking care of a, a family member while I'm going to school, and and I just want to put my head down and get my work done. And you know, I, I don't have time to fight. I just wanna I just want to get through it. And so if I've got to take another course, well, you know, I've persevered this far. I've I've you know I've got to do everything that I can to to just get through it. Um, but we 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 can't let those barriers stay in place anymore. I, I love this because those barriers really demonstrate why we need to have seamless transfer. I, you know, I look at Montgomery College, we have more than 80 articulation agreements with Maryland public four-year institutions. That's a lot considering that there are only 12 University of Maryland system institutions. So this means that if a student is interested in earning a baccalaureate degree at a particular school, she will want to determine if that institution has an articulation agreement with MC so they will know that their classes are transferring. And as you 
point out, this can be a daunting, overwhelming, and particularly confusing process for students, particularly who are oftentimes first generation, who are oftentimes new immigrants to this country. So the idea that we uh, are coming up with is to really help our students contemplate transfer by creating a transfer matrix or a scorecard of some sort to really help them see the pertinent information about our four-year partners so that our students can make informed decisions. Uh, some of the things we're looking about in terms of data, how many scholarships have MC students been offered over the past three years? Uh, what is the typical time to complete after transfer? Uh, what services are offered for students with children? You know, as we were talking about earlier, as leaders, I think I think it's important for us to be thinking about seamless transfer and really be thinking about that in ways of creating systemic change. So I know this is something that you've talked a lot about and have some intimate knowledge about because we've talked about sometimes how things are lost. You know, as a policymaker, what do you see as the value of having a more systemic transfer process? And you've, you've mentioned a few of those things earlier. What advice would you have for me and other community college presidents to really help achieve this goal? Because we've got to figure out how to knock down those barriers to build a system that Maryland needs that really crafts a two plus two program. Yeah, I mean, you're you're 100 percent correct. I mean, it's, uh, you know, nationwide. Um, and, and again, you know, I mentioned that we don't we don't necessarily have the, the hard data in Maryland, but nationwide, you know, almost 50 percent of the credits that, that students try to transfer um, or 50 percent of the students who try to transfer lose some of their credits in that process. And we know that Maryland is probably very, very similar. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you all are some of the best advocates in, in, in Annapolis, um, you know, and, and I have to give credit to, to you and your colleagues at the Maryland Association of Maryland Association of Community Colleges who, you know, are, are often regularly in our offices, you know, bringing students down. Um, and that that is that is the first step. But, um, you know, I think we, we have a couple of unique opportunities, um, you know, to to really do something about it. And I think, you know, I mentioned the, the promise program. Right, the the amount of money that um, you know that Maryland has invested in making community college free for students, um, we we then have to make sure that that next step for them, right? The the idea is, you know, for some students, you're right, it's they want to get their associate's degree, they want to get that credential, but for the students who want to go on, if we're providing them a pathway to community college, we then have to provide them a pathway to the four year to their four year system, um, and so that I think is forcing is forcing the issue a little bit more. Um, the other, you know, big, uh, big piece of policy that I think is going to is going to force us. Um, and when I say us, I mean, you know, policymakers, the folks at, at our four year institutions and the community colleges to work together is is the um, the Kerwin Commission and the blueprint for Maryland's future. And, you know, that the reason I bring that up is because the blueprint, we really emphasize the importance of dual enrollment programs. And that is where, you know, we have we have students who have who have completed, you know, sort of uh, high school coursework by, you know, by sophomore year, and they're taking advanced college credits, you know, in their junior and senior year of high school, which is giving them a huge leg up um, in college completion. And again, you know, that's not just for, for students from, from high income backgrounds, for students from low income backgrounds, that can be huge, getting them, you know, uh, a taste of what college life is like while they're still in high school with that, that support system, giving them a leg up to say, you know, you could potentially knock out between 30 and 60 credits before you even graduate high school. Well, that's wonderful, but those credits need to again transfer. Um, and so, you know, as we as, as a state are, are looking at at rightly investing what what could be, you know, four or five billion dollars in our K-12 system and making sure that we have, you know, the best prepared high school graduates, we have to make sure that little things like, you know, the arts system or, you know, a computer uh, computer transfer agreement do not get in the way of preparing our students. And so I think you know the the advocacy that that you and and your you know president colleagues across the state have already been doing, and you know, and these two other big policy issues that that frankly, uh, you know, have have been front and center in the, in the debates on education in Annapolis will really I think give us an opportunity to fix this issue uh, and and make huge progress. Well, you just made my day by saying that because I think this is important work and to know we have champions like you uh, means so much to us as a community college sector. But I also know that we aren't the only thing on your plate. <laughs> so here we are in mid-December, you're getting ready for the Maryland General Assembly's legislative session, which is gonna begin next month. I wonder if you might talk to us about the 2021 legislative uh, session. What are your goals for the upcoming session and, and what are your plans for seamless transfer and other types of legislation this year? Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, the pandemic is, is front and center on, on many of our minds, um, you know, and I hope uh, everybody watching is staying safe and healthy, 
Um, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which uh, I think, again, is a testament to, to many of the folks in our community and the work that they've been doing. Um, but we, we need to make sure that we are providing, you know, adequate recovery and, uh, and safety net support for, for families who don't have the luxury of, of being at home or don't have the luxury of, you know, of, uh, of working remotely. Um, and, and first and foremost, that as an appropriator who, you know, deals with the budget, that's going to be our top priority. Um, you know, a, a budget to me is, is the best statement of principles. You know, policy is wonderful, but it works on paper unless you have the money to actually back it up. And, and so I think, you know, for many of us um, in Annapolis, that is that is going to be the, the number one priority is, is keeping families safe, uh, you know, and keeping that safety net uh, in, in place for, for, for too many folks who, who are right on the edge. Um, so, you know, we're also going to see a session that's going to look uh, a lot different than I think many of you, uh, you know, who spend time in Annapolis are used to. Um, you know, we're not going to be gathering in person. Um, everything is going to be is going to be virtual and remote. And while you know that creates some challenges, I think it really creates a lot of opportunities. And 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 particularly for you know for many of your students who, frankly, it's it's hard to be able to take a full day off. You know, to come down to Annapolis to testify on bills to be you know part of the process. And and one of the silver linings to this is it is forcing us as as a general assembly to frankly, bring our infrastructure into the 21st century to stream all of our committee hearings, all of our meetings, all of our voting sessions to allow, you know, people to give testimony by by Zoom, by by remote, uh, you know, by remote access. So instead of having, again, to drive to Annapolis and spend potentially five or six hours waiting for your bill to be called, you know, you will be able to do it online, you know, in your living room, uh, you know, potentially in your pajamas, uh, at least, you know, from <laughs> from place down. Um, but it's going to make, I think, the the process so much more open for folks, um, which which is a huge benefit and, and something that I hope, even when we're able to return to uh, to normal, um, that that we keep in place. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, especially on this issue, we're we're going to bring a bill back called the Transfer with Success Act. That you know, I have to thank you and and again the the Maryland Association of Community Colleges for for just tremendous support on the bill. We introduced it last session, uh, made it out of the House of Delegates. I think uh, you know, if if last year had been Last session had been a little bit more, more normal. Uh, as many of you may know, we, we adjourned our session three weeks early um, because of the pandemic, which is uh, the first time that's happened actually since the Civil War. Um, you know, so a lot of really great bills, um, you know, just kind of and out of time, unfortunately. A lot of stuff uh, makes it across the finish line between both chambers in that last sort of three or four weeks of session. Um, and, and because we ran short and we, we just needed to really prioritize work around the pandemic, a lot of bills just kind of fell by the wayside. And so we're bringing that bill back. Um, and I have a lot of hope. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of interest in the Senate in it as well. Um, and and what that bill does is it is it's a first step. It's it's certainly not a panacea, um, but it 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 helps identify and and hopefully fix sort of two of the gaps that that we know exist. One is timely information for students when they transfer, um, and and that means you know if 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 a course is not going to to transfer instead of waiting, you know, potentially again six or eight months. We, we want a process in place between you know, the, the community college and the four-year school to have that conversation immediately so that a student knows, well, you know, maybe, maybe the advisor didn't know that there was a new articulation agreement we signed a year ago, or you know, maybe they looked at the wrong syllabus and they didn't know that, that this course actually satisfies X, Y, or Z. So instead of that student you know, having to, to retake the class, they can have that conversation immediately. And even if the course doesn't transfer, at least they get the credits. Um, the, the other piece, you know, we've talked about data is it requires um, a report to be produced each year uh, that shows all the classes that did not transfer. So again, you know, if, if a community college doesn't know that maybe, maybe they need to tweak a class a little bit and add something in because, you know, uh, University of Maryland or, or Frostburg requires something a little bit different. Instead of, again, that being sort of out there in the, you know, in the ether and, and unclear from both sides, there will be very, very, very clear information so that, you know, the institutions can talk to one another and make sure that they know what needs to be done for those courses to transfer. And like I said, this is not, you know, it's not a panacea. There's a lot of other work, um, you know, frankly, that, that I'm excited to do um, next interim. We have a little bit more room, hopefully, and the pandemic is behind us. But this is a huge first step, um, I think, to, to get streamlining the process and, and making sure that, that students are are getting what they need um, to be able to continue their higher ed. And, and frankly, it's also about fiscal responsibility as a state. Um, you know, we can't subsidize community colleges, then subsidize the four years and essentially double pay for those, you know, for those ca uh, classes. I would much rather we, we give that money to students in financial aid and, and support uh, and make higher ed more accessible for more students than to essentially pay for that course to be, be taken twice. 
I, this is why, again, you, you are, are my transfer champion, because you really understand what we're talking about transfer both as a personal good, but also a public good. And we don't talk about it that way oftentimes. So, and, and going to your other points, if, if budgets, I think oftentimes are a reflection of values, I think legislation is the manifestation of those values. So if you're going to actually say you believe in something, then how you choose to live by it, I think is equally important. So uh, that's great. I'm so grateful to you for that very clear thoughtfulness about that. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that we might get in the last five minutes a, a little cameo appearance of somebody before I say thank you uh, for joining us because I think that uh, we're talking about this being the very special time of the year where we're having the holidays and uh, we're all coming to an end here and really have had a very difficult year as you and I talked about early on about how this pandemic has been uh, certain portions of our community have been hurt more and hurt tragically and, and have had a very difficult time. But also this idea of what this period could be to, in terms of us uh, reclaiming our time with family and staying connected to us, uh, that's so important. You have demonstrated to us today what this is like being a, uh, a delegate, being a public servant, but also being a father, a husband, uh, being someone who's deeply committed to your constituents. I'm just so grateful uh, that you joined me today and, and took time to talk about transfer, to talk about your legislative agenda, uh, because we all know that having homegrown talent that can earn a baccalaureate degree so they can be a part of the workforce that we need in Montgomery County to thrive is so important. So I thank you for everything you do for our county and for Montgomery College students and would love to give you an opportunity before we go if you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with us. Well, Dr. Pollard, you're uh, you're again much too kind, and I, I have to say, right, right back at you. Um, you know, we're we're all in this together, um, and then unfortunately, I, I just checked my phone. And I texted my wife. Uh, we have we have a seven month old, um, which is is crazy to believe uh, that that he's he's experienced this as uh, you know from from birth to where he is now. He's unfortunately asleep. Um, <sighs> If we all got to take as many naps as uh, as our little one, um, so so no cameo, unfortunately. Um, but you know, I I just want to again thank you and and your colleagues for all the work that you have done to support our community. Um, you know, I have a, a member of my staff who's a proud MC graduate. Um, she's currently at the University of uh, of Maryland College Park, and her husband is um, you know is also at uh, at at Montgomery College. And we were having a conversation, and and she's a DACA recipient, uh, proud proud DACA recipient, um, you know, how, just how much the support that MC has given her husband has meant to her family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's, it's really easy sometimes, as we were talking about earlier, you know, when we just kind of see the, the numbers on the page to kind of forget what that means to, to, you know, to the, uh, to our, to our families and our community. And, and it is so important, the role that you all have played during this pandemic to provide support to, to your students, um, you know, who, who, frankly, you know, are, are able to are able to continue doing what they're doing because of of that support. And and so I just wanted to thank you all. Um, you know, your your work has not gone unnoticed. It's not unappreciated. Um, and and just say thank you. Um, you know, we'll get through this all together. But um, we're all better when we all do better when we're all doing better. So mm -hmm. thank you, thank you for everything. I think that's the perfect way to end. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, our guest was a delegate, Jared Solomon, who spoke to us on seamless transfer. This is Montgomery College's uh, discussion with decision makers and so grateful to have had the opportunity to be with you. Thank you as always to my office who helps get us ready for this and certainly uh, to MCTV who produces. Hope you all have a glorious holiday season. I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Take care and be well.